we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 34 here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, we'll begin by reading verses 20 through 22. Uh, I'll do a little recap for just a moment and we'll get into our study. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse uh, 20, reading to verse 22. Paul writes, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so Paul is speaking concerning, obviously, resurrection. And I'll remind you that last time we were together, Paul had given six negatives that, if true, would would actually empty the gospel of its power. And last time we were together, um, we looked at these things. He had said in verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And so everything related to one question, what if Jesus Christ died but remained in the grave? What if he were not resurrected? And as we saw that question and he began to answer it, we noticed that uh, there were at least six things that would be regarded as negatives. One, we pointed out that the preaching of the gospel would be futile. Second, trusting uh, the gospel would also be in vain. Third, he said the apostles would be liars. Fourth, uh, believers would still be in their sins. Fifth, the dead have perished. And finally, he said Christians of all people should be more, most pitied. And so he's been speaking concerning the resurrection and all. And so the point he's making in verse 20 is simply that Christ is risen from the dead. And since Jesus is risen from the dead, believers need not to be pitied. Christians don't need to be pitied because Jesus indeed is risen from the dead. Since he's risen, the resurrection of his disciples must also occur. And that's what he speaks about in verse 20 when he says, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, when he speaks about those who have fallen asleep, He's not talking about those who go to Bible studies on Sunday night. <laughs> the term falling asleep or fallen asleep is a, what is referred to as a euphemism. It's a, it's a word that relates to, in a tender sense, it speaks of death. And, and this is the third time, by the way, in this chapter that he has spoken of death as sleep. Remember with me in verse, in verse 6, he had said, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some, notice, have fallen asleep. In verse 18, he had said, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And then he'll say it again in uh, verse 51 of this chapter, uh, when he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. So sleep is another way of speaking of death. It's an Old Testament as well as a New Te Testament expression concerning death. In the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so sleeping is a picture of death. Why is it a picture of death? Because when somebody is dead and they're in that casket, they have the appearance of sleeping. That's why it's referred to as sleeping. In the New Testament, in John chapter 11, verses 11 through 14, it says, he went, to, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus said, shut up, lunkheads. No, he didn't say that, that's mine. But it goes on to say, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And so when he speaks concerning sleep, those who have fallen asleep, that's a way of referring to death. So Jesus has become what Paul calls the first fruits of, of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits. What are the first fruits? Well, in the Old Testament, what are called first fruits are referring to a representative sample of a harvest. The first fruits indicate that there's a full harvest to follow. And under Jewish law, they could not harvest their grain until an offering was made, and that offering was called a first fruits offering. 
Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11 in the Old Testament reads, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I'm going to give you and reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. So Jesus' resurrection is what is called the first fruits of the resurrection, and that would be in picturing the believing dead. In his death and resurrection, Jesus made himself an offering to the Father on our behalf, and as the first fruits, Jesus is paving the way for the harvest for the rest of the crop. The rest of the crop would be us. So his resurrection was not an isolated event, but it actually is a picture of what is going to take place for us. Now, Paul here is referring to a permanent resurrection because we know that there are other resurrections that already have occurred in both the Old and the New Testament. There is a, a story of a widow, uh, Zarephath, uh, Zarephath, who had uh, a son who had died and was brought back to life. Uh, we have uh, uh, an instance of uh, a, a Shumanite woman who was uh, mentioned in resurrection mentioned in Second Kings chapter 4. But uh, we know in the Old Testament we see these incidents, but we also see them in the New. In the New Testament, you might find this interesting, in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus raised three people from the dead. Um, remember the story of the widow of Nain? The widow of Nain had a son. She was a widow and only had one son, her only son. And her son had died. And Jesus was going into this region by the city of Nain. The city of Nain, if you're looking at a map of the um, nation of Israel, it's by the Sea of Galilee. And Nain is located about 10 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus was up in that area. And as Jesus was up there ministering, he sees a, uh, a funeral uh, procession and there's a woman who is weeping. And as she's weeping, uh, Luke tells us that uh, it's because she's a widow and her only son has died. And in that culture, the uh, husband was responsible for caring for his wife. When he died, that responsibility would fall upon the shoulders of the son. But when the son dies, that leaves her without any way of, of uh, surviving. And so this woman is completely destitute. And as she's in this funeral procession, the Lord Jesus Christ walks up and he ministers and he raises this woman's son from the dead. We see that in Luke chapter 7. There's another incident where Jesus was ministering. It's found also in Luke in chapter 8. There's a man whose name is Jairus. Jairus is uh, uh, an official whose daughter is very ill, and he comes and speaks to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, my daughter is near death. Please come and please help her. And on his way, as Jesus is about to go to minister, he's interrupted by a woman who had an issue of blood, and he stays there and ministers to this woman and brings healing to her. But in the meantime, uh, some of the people come and say to uh, Jairus, um, no need to bother the master any longer. Your daughter has died. And so Jesus still goes to the man's house. And as he goes to the man's house, he enters into the room where this little girl's body is. And um, he says just before he goes in, we all know the story. Before he goes in, he says, don't be concerned about it. She's only sleeping. And those who were there weeping and carrying on over this began to laugh him to scorn because they knew she was dead. And yet Jesus goes into that room. He takes with him three of his men and he walks up to where this little girl is and he says to her in Aramaic, Talita Kumi, which means little girl, I say unto you, arise and she comes to life. And so there's a resurrection. And mentioned a moment before about Lazarus. Lazarus in John chapter 11, verse 44, was dead. And there comes the Lord Jesus Christ and he enters into that, uh, into the city there and uh, asks, where is, where did you lay him? And they say to him, um, and well, they take him to the place, but they, they say as he wants to enter in and roll that, that stone away, they say, Master, um, he's been dead four days and the smell of death is inside of that, that tomb. And, and Jesus stands there and, and weeps there at the tomb. But 
he cries out, and what's he say? Lazarus, come forth. And it's been said before, even as Lazarus comes hopping out with his, his uh, grave cloths on, Jesus specifically said, Lazarus, because if he'd have said, come forth, all the other ones would have come out too. I don't know that that's true, but that's kind of a humorous thought. But anyway, but he says, come forth. And so you have these uh, resurrections. There are some who would speak of the resurrections as actually resuscitations. But they were dead and they were brought back to life, their resurrection. And so what we have here is, uh, is Jesus Christ who brings resurrection. Now, all of these who were brought back to life eventually died again. So Jesus is the first to be resurrected and to remain alive. And so verse 20 again, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. All mankind descends from Adam and Eve, and all mankind have Adam's sin nature, and the sin nature that we have, well, sin leads to death. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. Um, all were in the loins of, of Adam. He, the first man, actually is the progenitor of all the human race. His human nature is given to all of us. So we have what is called an Adamic nature. The Adamic nature is another way of speaking of our sin nature. So what he's saying here is Adam sinned, Adam died, we are all descended from Adam, therefore we also die. So by man came death, but also by man comes resurrection from the dead. So by this man, Jesus, comes the resurrection of the dead. So Jesus' death and resurrection brings life to those who believe in him. And Romans 5.19 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. So, verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, when it says, as in Adam all die, that speaks of the human race. But when the word all is used in reference to Christ, that doesn't include those who reject Jesus as their Savior. You see, righteousness comes only by faith in the work of Christ on our behalf. People will be raised, but they'll enter into judgment. There are those who are raised, who are saved, to enter into glory with the Lord. And so they're all going to be raised, but some will go into judgment. And we who believe in Christ are going to enter into, into heaven to be with him. In verse uh, 22, 23, rather, it says, But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ that is coming. And so there's an order involved, Jesus first and then those who belong to him. Now, just as something that might add to our understanding of this, Scripture seems to indicate that the resurrection is not a single event, though it's regarded to as a single event in the sense that it's referred to as resurrection, but you actually have an order. Um, the Bible speaks concerning resurrection, and it speaks really of the two resurrections. One is the resurrection of the just, and the other is the resurrection of the unjust. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. But he goes on in Revelation 20 and verse 12 to say, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And then he goes on in verse 15 to say, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So you have the resurrection of the just, but you have the resurrection of the unjust. Some are resurrected to life and some are resurrected to everlasting shame. Now, in this first resurrection, I'll go a little further. It appears that there are at least three stages, at least three stages in what is called the first resurrection. You have the first stage, which is believers from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So you have those from 
uh, Pentecost to the rapture. Then you have the tribulation saints. In Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You also have the Old Testament saints, and that would be speaking of both resurrections, and that I mentioned to you earlier in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And so he's speaking of the resurrection. He says again, verse 23, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. And when he said, then comes the end, that occurs after the second coming and the resurrection and establishment of his kingdom. All things are going to return to what they originally were designed to be and what they originally were at that time. Verse 25, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. I was mentioning today in uh, one of the services, I didn't say it in all three services, I said it in one of the services, that there's this attitude sometimes, and I'll expand on it a bit, there's this attitude sometimes that um, death is like, well, I've heard it said, you know, it's a doorway into eternity, and some have even referred to death as being like their friend. Bi the Bible doesn't teach that death is your friend. Death is your enemy. That's what we just read right now, that it's an enemy. Death is an enemy. The last enemy that will be destroyed, he said, is death. The wages of sin is death. Death represents a separation between man and God. It wasn't God's intent that man should live for a short time and then die. Look at all the pain that some of us have suffered through in our grieving for the loss of those whom we've loved. And think of those who have gone through a prolonged illness where they just continue on and on and on and would even wish that they could die and have yet to be able to do so. And they're in such terrible pain and all. It, that, that isn't a friend. That isn't God's design for you. That's not what God intended for us. He didn't intend for us to be born with that, that knowledge of anticipation that one day I'm going to ultimately die. When you're young, when you're 10, 15, 20 years old, you never think about it, really. It's not something that most people think about. At least I didn't. I was aware that one of these days when I'm real old, that may happen. But you never really think about that. I mean, old to me was over 40, you know. And so, yeah, when you get real ancient and old, like 40 or something, you know, then you'll probably die. You never think about it. But the longer you're alive, the more aware you are that the journey in front of you is a shorter duration than the one behind you. There are less days in front than there are behind. And you begin to be aware of that. And you begin to be aware of the fact that life is brief. You, you become aware of the fact that, that, that your, your body is, is rebelling against you. Now, it's, it's not acting like it's supposed to. When you used to roll out of bed and land on your feet, now you roll out of bed and land on your head. I mean, it's just a different thing. You, 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 you get out of bed and your body screams and says, get back in there right now. It's just that way. And, and you begin to have pains that you never had before, and, and you start making very close relationships with doctors and and it's just, it's just an amazing thing. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned on Wednesday, perhaps some of you were there, that I had to go to the doctor on Wednesday and I had to have another biopsy because it turns out I have cancer, another little cancer on my skin. And, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 the, my, my first dermatologist said, you used to like the sun, didn't you? And I said, yes, the sun and I were friends. And in reality, no, the sun like death is your enemy you know, because it produces something on your skin. It can, something on your skin called skin cancer. And so I, I have uh, some removed from my left shoulder. I have some on my face. 
And he says, oh, and you've got some more we're going to have to deal with after this. You know, and, and that's not good news. That's bad news. You, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear these things. You know, but that's part of just growing older. That's part of what life is. And so as you grow older, you become aware of the fact that, that, uh, that there's something awaiting you. Now, the Bible doesn't call it a friend. The Bible calls it an enemy. But that enemy has been conquered by Jesus Christ. And because the enemy has been conquered by life, you don't have fear of it. Though it's referred to as an enemy, it isn't something you're afraid of. It's not something that you fear entering into. And from that aspect, I agree with my brothers and sisters who will say it's an entrance into something greater, which indeed it is. But as, as Paul is speaking here, he's speaking of the fact that uh, death is an enemy. Now, it says here he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So Jesus' final act after his 1,000-year reign is yielding the redeemed world to his father and death is not finally abolished until after the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, in verse 27, for he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so God the Father is the exception when all things are put under the feet of Jesus. God is the exception because he is not subject to Christ because he, the Father, is the one who gave Jesus authority. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In John 5, 26 and 27, Jesus said, As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. So throughout his incarnation, until he presents the kingdom to his father, he is the servant. When his work is completed, he assumes his former place in harmony within what is called the Trinity. Jesus continues to reign in what is called Trinitarian glory. Now, verse 29, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? This is one of the most interesting New Testament scriptures you're going to find. Baptism for the dead. I want you to see this. I'll read it again and do my very best to confuse you. What will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Have any of you ever spoken to a Mormon? Raise your hand if you have. I'm interested. Okay. The Mormons teach what? They teach baptism for the dead. You know Ancestry.com and genealogical services like that? They, their connections to the Mormon um, genealogical services that they have. Mormons believe that people who died without being baptized can receive what is called baptism by proxy. So we'll say my grandfather died, but I'm not sure that he was baptized. Because they believe baptism is necessary to enter into glory, I, in my grandfather's name, if I were Mormon, would be baptized so that my grandfather could be in, could enter into, into, into glory. And so the Mormon believes in and teaches, and I've had conversations with them concerning this, they believe in what is called baptism for the dead. When you speak to them, they will take it right out of the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. And they will say, well, then what's the scripture say? Notice what it says. Why are they baptized for the dead? And so that is something that some of you perhaps have encountered if you've ever talked to or shared with or had conversation with with somebody who's of the Mormon persuasion. Is that what Paul is teaching? Is Paul teaching that in order for you to enter into the kingdom, you need to be water baptized? Is that what he's saying? What Paul is doing here is he's speaking about something that it's quite obvious the Corinthian church is very familiar with. That is why he includes this practice in his defense of the resurrection. 
But what is it that he's speaking about when he says baptized for the dead? There are those who believe that Paul is referring to Jesus when he speaks of the dead. And so they would say that it, the question he's asking is, why get baptized in the name of a dead Savior? Jesus would still be dead if not resurrected. And there are those who would say that's what he's referring to. He's referring to Jesus when he speaks of being baptized for the dead. Also, there are those who believe that Paul is speaking of receiving baptism on behalf of dead persons. Well, that produces a practice based on a single obscure scripture. Uh, suffice it to say, nowhere does the Bible ever say that anyone could receive baptism by proxy. Nowhere. When you look at the verses that refer to baptism, you see verses like Mark 16, verse 16, where it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It doesn't say that if I believe on behalf of somebody else, it speaks of a personal faith that I have when I receive baptism. Acts 2.41 says, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. So nowhere does the Bible ever say that anyone receives baptism by proxy. So the simplest answer would be, believers are being saved because of the witness of martyrs. That is one of the ancient uh, uh, interpretations of this scripture. They're being saved um, because of the witness of martyrs. If the dead do not rise, why is there such an impact being made through their ministry? People who loved the Lord had a tremendous ministry impact. People saw the way they lived and the way they died. And knowing that the way they lived and died was based on their faith in God through Jesus Christ, these martyrs became a great example of what it means to live a life sold out for God. The impact of these people's lives was of such immense proportion that there were people who came to faith in Christ based on the gospel tale as well as the awareness of the lives that these people lived. And because the impact was made through their life that was so significant, then as a result of seeing someone living for Jesus Christ, it helped to convince me that that way is true, then Paul could be referring to the fact that people are receiving baptism because they know of those who loved God and laid their life down in their faith towards him, and thus it impacted them. And in memory of what these people did, which impacted them so much, they came to faith in Christ and received water baptism and signified that. And so that's the simplest way to approach that. That, again, is an obscure verse, but it would seem that they're being baptized because they have been influenced by those who live for Christ, and it helped to convert them. Verse 30, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Why do we put ourselves in such danger if there's no such thing as a resurrection? When you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, it's a life that is just an amazing life. He speaks concerning the things that he goes through in a variety of, of passages, but one of the places is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, Paul says this, and I want you to hear this. Paul, speaking of his life, said, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. Paul had what, what I like to refer to as a, an eternal framework. The things that he went through for him were minor inconveniences. 
Paul was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He, yet he made it his chief aim to take the name of Jesus Christ for his name had never been mentioned. He said, I don't want to build on another man's foundation. I want to take this gospel out and I want to preach this name, this name Jesus, so that all will hear it and all will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to take this message out and I'm willing to pay the price, whatever it may be. So there are times that he was beaten. There were times that he was actually stoned. There were times when, when he was um, shipwrecked. There were so many times that he went through so much pain. You know, Jesus Christ was, was beaten and uh, received 39 stripes. And when somebody during the time of Christ would receive that kind of lashing, it was called the living death because when you were beaten in that fashion with that cat of nine tails, the opening, the laceration, the beating, the loss of blood and shock, the dehydration and all that went along with that was like a death penalty. And many people died under the lash. When Jesus Christ received 39 stripes, that was, that was the, the maximum. He received at least 39 stripes, which would have been maximum under Jewish law because Jewish law said that you would receive 40 stripes, save one. 40 was a number of judgment. 39 is a number of mercy. So judgment is always to be tempered by mercy. So Jesus received no less than 39 stripes. If you went beyond 39, oftentimes the people, the prisoners, would be put to death under the lash because they would die through the severity of such beating. And so when you read about Jesus and you read what happened and you take some time to investigate what would have occurred and you know that huge Portions of his flesh were ripped off, his, his, his chest, his back was opened, it was lacerated, it looked like hamburger, blood was pouring all over. Jesus Christ was losing all of his blood. Paul says, I received 39 stripes, not one time, I received 39 stripes three times. Not just once, but a second time. And not just a second time, but a third time. His back must have been totally scarred from the first time that he received those stripes. And then he went through it again. And then his back was opened up a second time. Then he went through it a third time. When he begins to speak of what he went through, guys, it's unbelievable, to be honest with you. The pain that he endured. But did he ever stop speaking? Did he ever stop preaching? No. To the point where he finally got his wish to stand before the Caesar and preach the gospel. I want to stand before him in Rome. That's my desire. That I might tell the most powerful man on the planet that there's one more powerful than you. And his name is Jesus. That was the heart of the Apostle Paul. And so when Paul is speaking concerning these things. When Paul is speaking concerning being in jeopardy. This is somebody who knew what that means. For us, let's be honest, for us, when we go through something, for us many times, um, we think persecution is because somebody, somebody made fun of us in the neighborhood uh, or, or they won't eat lunch with me on the job site anymore because I'm a Christian. And, 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 and then we cry ourselves to sleep at night. Oh, how I'm suffering. And we really don't understand. We just don't get it. How that in so many places, in so many countries, uh, and even in certain pockets here in the United States, that it's actually a dangerous thing to, pre to present yourself as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that it can be dangerous and even life-threatening. But what is it that kept Paul moving? Paul kept moving in that way because he had what I call an eternal framework. In Romans 8, verse 18, he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory of that will be revealed in us. Because he said, I'm just passing through. Because the rejection, the persecution, the beatings, the jailings, the shipwreck, and so many other things that I've endured are just things that are temporary. These are things that do not last. They're not eternal. He had an eternal framework. When he says in verse 31, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. By boasting in you, I affirm by the boasting in you, by seeing fruit in Corinth, I need to tell you that strengthens me to continue in my ministry. To see God moving in your midst strengthens me to continue preaching the gospel. 
He said in verse 31, I die daily. My life is disciplined in every area for one thing, and that's to follow the Lord. Why die daily to desires of the flesh if you could just yield to those desires and be satisfied? This would make the most sense for those, if they didn't have an eternal framework, live for today. Just live for the day. Notice what he says in verse 32. He says, if in this manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Get as much as you can out of, uh, out of life right now. Uh, do as much as you can and get as much as you can because, frankly, you're just worm food. You're going to die, you're going to be buried, and you're going to be consumed, and that's it. So just get it all. You know, they're, you know, you know go for the gold. You know, do everything that you can to be satisfied now. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die. Just enjoy life and get all you can out of it. There are a lot of people, by the way, that's exactly how they live. It's all about them. If there's anything that I'm noticing has, is on the ascendancy, and it's, and it's been for, for a number of years now. This isn't new, and all of you have observed it, I'm sure. But if there's anything that I see philosophically that's on the ascendancy, it's the philosophy of narcissism. This attitude of, um, of uh, self-love, this attitude of getting all that I can for me. A narcissus uh, is an individual who was looking into, I believe, a pool of water and fell in love with the image that he was beholding. The image he was beholding was himself. And that's where we get the term uh, narcissist from. It speaks of self-love. It speaks of putting myself before anybody else. And narcissism is one of the chief sins, if not the chief sin right now that I'm seeing uh, in our society that we live in, which is, is biblically uh, what Paul said would be the sign of the last days when he began to give a list in 2 Timothy concerning how you know you're living in the last days. He said, men shall be lovers of themselves. That's the first thing he says. Men shall be lovers of themselves. And the second thing, lovers of money. And if there's anything in our society that we can all, I think, agree on is there is a tremendous amount of self-love. And this attitude of self-love is an attitude that says it really doesn't matter how you feel about what I do. It's really none of your business as long as I'm happy. It's that philosophy, do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Then we constantly argue and say nothing I do hurts anybody else. I've heard that coming from guys who are committing adultery. And they're saying it doesn't hurt anybody. It really doesn't hurt anybody. N no, it doesn't hurt anybody except your wife and your children. It doesn't hurt anybody except for your, your mom and your dad. It, it really doesn't hurt anybody except for your friendships and relationships that you have. It doesn't hurt anybody except, no, the fact is it hurts everybody because sin always does. Sin always has repercussions. And yet we have people who will argue hammer and tong. It really doesn't matter how you feel about my freedoms. The things that please me shouldn't really be something you're worried about. You have that attitude in the world, but you also have that attitude in the church. Because when somebody is confronted, if they're doing something wrong and somebody lovingly says to them, I'm concerned for you, one of the very first things people will say, and I've had it said to me, is why don't you just mind your own business? I can still remember one lady who was uh, in love with gossiping and finally, I spoke to her, and I wasn't a pastor. I was a young believer. I was like 23 years old at the time. And I spoke to her on one occasion, and I said, her name was Kathy. I can mention her name. Um, she's not here right now. No, she's, uh, <laughs> she's not around. She, she lives in another state. But, um, but I mentioned to her, Kathy, I said, Kathy, I said, you, um, you have a fondness for, for gossiping, and it really is not right. You really shouldn't do that. And she said to me, so when did, when did the Holy Spirit move over and make you God? You know, she didn't appreciate that. And I said, oh, I've always been God, but that's a different subject. <laughs> no. But that was the whole thing. When did you become God? When did you become capable of telling me how I should live? But I thought that we were to provoke one another to love and good works. I thought we were to exhort one another while it is still today and encourage them to live for Jesus. I thought that's what holy provocation is, is for me to be an encouragement to you to live for Jesus and you to be an encouragement to me 
to live for Jesus. I thought that's how fire keeps being fire, how it keeps hot, by us continually encouraging one another as we see the day approaching. I think that's what Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, was making, uh, was saying when he wrote those words. And, and, and aren't I supposed to love you enough to tell you the truth? And, and, and shouldn't I care enough to help you? And I'm more than willing for you to help me. But what we live in today, guys, and you know this, is a society that is so caught up with self-love that it's very difficult for you to bring a word of correction to anybody. In church, when, I, when I'm teaching and the passage demands uh, a very clear presentation, uh, there are so many people who get upset. Sometimes I, I, it's like I'm inside a restaurant and they're making toast uh, and all the toast goes up and springs out of the toaster. Well, when I'm, when I'm speaking, they're bringing up out of the chairs and, and they're walking out, you know, because some things are difficult for them to hear. They don't want to hear that. Uh, it happened, uh, I've had that in, in, for so many years because I, I don't take the, um, the tact of sharing the word of God and, and watering it down and try and say what it's saying. Um, I, I used to have a guest, I used to speak as a guest in a friend of mine's church. Um, whenever he was out of the pulpit, he'd asked me to come and he had Thursday night studies so I could go on Thursdays and teach. And it happened so regularly where people would get up and walk out that I finally said, now listen. I was introducing my message and I said, now listen, I'm going to say some things today that you're going to get mad at because every time I come, you do. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you. I mean, I actually did this. I'm going to ask you, would you please just listen to the whole message, take its context and, and listen to what's being said? Please? You know, I said, okay, you ready? Yeah. About 20 minutes into it, somebody gets up. They got mad. It was the pastor. No, they got up. <laughs> And they had metal doors. They were metal fire doors. And they went out the side. It's like going out this side right here. They went out the side door, metal door, and slammed it just to make their point, you know. So, listen, I, I see self-love as something that has been plaguing society and the church for forever. And it is a sign that you're living in the last days when you are not willing to butt up with healthy doctrine. When, when a person is not willing to hear out a message, when they're not willing to receive what God has for them, it's symptomatic of a bad day in the church because people don't want to hear. Paul had made it very clear that it isn't one of these attitudes, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He's saying life is much deeper than that. Now, he goes on and says, in verse 33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. My mom used to say, show me a man's friends and I will show you the man. There's a lot of truth to that. It's not 100% accurate, of course, because that was said about Jesus. Because they said concerning Jesus, this man eats with publicans and sinners. And the Pharisees believed that sin was basically something that you could catch. And uh, if you hang around with sinners, then it shows that you are like them. And so they actually would point to Jesus and they would say to his disciples, why does your master uh, eat with publicans and sinners? What they were saying is they were saying the reason he eats with them is because he is like them. And so on the one hand, that's not always true. On the other hand, it is also true that we're influenced by those who we spend the most time with. There's no doubt about that. And so when a man or a woman chooses a friend, choose wisely. Because your friend, the closest friend you have, is also probably your pastor. What I am is I'm the guy who stands up here or sits up here and talks about God. And people sit out like right now, they're sitting out there and uh, listening when they're not counting panels on the wall or <laughs> thinking things like that, texting. They're listening, but sometimes with maybe 
a minimum of concentration and really a minimum of attention. Because there's a lot of things on their mind after all. Or they may hear something that to them it may cause them to think. So they go out afterwards maybe to get some coffee or if it's after church on a Sunday, they go out to a restaurant and they sit around a table. And perhaps the message comes, comes up in the conversation. And something was said that day that may have been a bit provoking, maybe even irritating, maybe convicting. And so what do they do? Pastor David said, I, this is an actual conversation. I'll give you one that I know. Pastor David said that we probably shouldn't be spending lots of time in clubs. Well, I think that's legalistic because I can witness in clubs. <laughs> and, and I think he's legalistic because he, he's telling us that we can't enjoy life. Did I say I've never said anything like that? What I've said is if you go to clubs, you're going to hell. No, I didn't say that either. <laughs> Just seeing if you're listening. Hey, most of you heard that. What I've said is something like, why waste your time going someplace when you can go somewhere where you're going to build your faith? Why don't you make choices to be where you grow instead of places that are sources of temptation? Be wise in what you're doing. Do you think you're going to go to a club and meet this godly man there as you're dancing? I don't think so. <laughs> Unless he's holding his Bible dancing, saying John 3.16, I don't think so, okay? It's probably not going to happen. That makes sense to me. I've said, okay, you want to argue about drinking? Because people say, well, Jesus made wine. When I first got saved, they said that, that God made the herb. And because we called marijuana herb, God made marijuana so that we could smoke and make connection with him. God also made poison ivy, I would say but we don't use it for toilet paper. <laughs> I mean, use your common sense, man. How come you're doing that? Why are you arguing that? That makes sense to me. It's nothing rocket science. So I learned a long time ago that uh, those who argue their freedoms very often are those who don't even walk in the spirit. They're, they're the ones... That, that will normally, when you ask them, because they're arguing with me, and, and, and I've had a lot of conversations over the years, uh, it's okay to, to drink, and I'm not going to hell if I have one drink, and, and they want to argue with me. And then, then you ask them, when's the last time you led someone to the Lord? When's the last time that you went out and shared your faith with somebody? They don't do that. They're, they're more busy wanting to go to the club to drink and dance. And so I'm not calling them a sinner. I'm not saying they're bad even. I'm just asking a question. Where's Jesus in your life? And, and the more you hang around with people who think like that, you're, well, what did he say? Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. It reduces your walk with the Lord. It doesn't build you up. So let me give you some old man advice. It's biblical. A long time ago, many years ago now, I began to think in terms of ministry and friendship. Ministry and friendship. I have people that, at that time especially, that I loved very much who were very close to me. But I realized that because they didn't really have a heart for the Lord, this was before I went into pastoral ministry, this was Years before I was ordained in the ministry, it was just as I was growing up in the Lord. I realized that for them, liberty meant an awful lot. But the liberty that they enjoyed were the sins that I was freed from. I didn't want to go back to drinking. I didn't want to go back to that life. But my friends who had been raised in the church felt that it was okay because under grace I can do whatever I want. Me, I was a, a, a drunk, and I and I and I was I was somebody who loved marijuana. I didn't like marijuana, 
I loved it. It was my sacrament. I mean, I enjoyed it. And I didn't just smoke a joint. I would have one behind my ear, one in my pocket, and I'd be smoking it. And I chain smoked marijuana. That's what I did. I liked it. And I didn't drink a beer. I drank a six pack. And when I finished the six pack, I went to a half gallon of wine. That's how I drank. So I was not a social drinker. I did not sit there and say, oh, let's have one of these Mai Tais. I didn't even know what a Mai Tai was. To me, let's drink some scotch, you know? And that's just the way I was, right? So I get saved. And now I've got Christian friends telling me, you're in Christ, God's grace. You can enjoy it. Don't be in bondage. Don't be so legalistic. And I start thinking about that, and I begin to realize if I go back to that life, it's like the pig going back to the mud. It's the dog returning to the vomit. I, I've been washed, and I've been cleaned. I don't want to go back. That's what I got saved from. And so the thing that, uh, that was difficult for me was realizing that. that and this was, this was 40 years ago, over 40 years ago where people wanted me to stay in bondage. Now, I understand it when the world does, because the world, the world doesn't necessarily want a Christian to have a glowing witness. What I had trouble with was my brothers and my sisters who wanted me to be in what I got saved from. That I didn't understand, and that I still don't understand. Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Your friends have such tremendous influence on you that one day you can wake up and you can ask yourself the question I finally woke up and asked myself, which was, how did I get back here? Which I did. How did I get back here? Sitting in a reception after my cousin had been married. I had been drinking and I was sitting in the front room and they had champagne, and I liked champagne. And I was drinking it, and we used to say we got, I got my buzz on, I got high. And I'm sitting in there, and my head is spinning, and two Christians come and sit next to me and say, you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And I say, yes. True story. I'm not kidding. Yes. Slurring my words. And they witnessed. Did you know that God so loved the world? I sure did. Did you know Jesus died on the cross for you? Yes, he did. I'm a Christian. I was drunk. And they're witnessing. And I'll never forget what I told them when they walked away. They said, okay, man, we'll see you later. And I said, here, there, or in the air. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord ripped me. He convicted me. See, my, my, my sin was alcohol. I got away from the drugs. It was alcohol. It was alcohol. I liked it. I like marijuana, but I knew uh, there's, there's some spiritual entanglements here. Stay away from this. It opens the door to other things. Alcohol? Well, you can buy it. I'm over 21. Nobody can tell me not to. That was my problem. I didn't drink all the time. I stopped drinking. But when someone offered me one, I'd want a second. And then I'd want a third. And by the fourth, I was starting to get drunk and the Lord worked on my life and one of the things that I'm teaching you right now and all these little silly stories is um, be careful who you let influence you what I had to learn to do was this I had to learn that following God was more important than anything else and I want to do that I had to learn that I have people I love who are really my ministry. And so 
I would just be aware. I would keep my spiritual guard up and I would be aware that they may want to do something or go somewhere that isn't edifying. So I had to be ready to say, no, thank you. I'm not going and I don't want to go. I had to learn to do that. But I also learned I have friends. My friends are the ones who don't stumble me. My friends are the ones who build me up in my faith. My friends are the ones that I can speak to and say, you know what, I'm going through something. Could you pray for me? I have friends that can say, this is what God's word says concerning this. Let's agree that the Lord will do this in our lives. That's a friend. And I made a decision a long, long time ago to know who my ministry is and to know who my friends are. Because your pastor, getting back to that, is not necessarily the man who is seated here right now. Your pastor is the one you're speaking to after the Bible study who disagrees with what I've been saying and gives to you what they really think. And you listen to them instead of what you've been hearing for the last 45 minutes. That's your pastor. That's the one who is speaking into your soul. That's the one who's directing your spiritual footsteps. All I am is an information giver. That person is your pastor. You need to know who your pastor is. You need to know who's influencing you. Because I'm telling you, the ones who love you the most are the ones who have the most influence. And they can talk you out of positions and into theirs simply through love. And they're not even using scripture. And when they do use scripture, it's out of context. You hear what I'm saying? It's true. What is Paul saying? Be careful. He's saying, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Finally, awake to righteousness. Do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Guard yourself against bad company. And guard yourself against bad messages. Because the fruit will be a lack of concern for the lost, and you will lose your desire to see people saved. What's interesting is Paul is saying, and it's like this is unbelievable, but he's saying in your congregation, you actually have people who don't know the Lord. Why is that? Now notice, some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Why is it? He's saying because they're not receiving the counsel of God. They're not receiving the whole counsel that should be setting them free. And because you have people who are in church who are very comfortable in church um, and are not convicted, that ought to cause you to be shameful or feel shame because the holiness of God is not evident in the church services and in the body of Christ. Anytime somebody who doesn't know Jesus feels very comfortable around those who do, tells me it's not just the love that the people have for them because that is a good thing, it's a great thing, but it tells me that they haven't really had a deep conversation yet with those people to see the difference between what they believe and what the Bible actually teaches. A lot of people aren't willing to ruffle feathers. There are whole church systems that have been built, guys, on making sure that the unchurched person doesn't feel uncomfortable in church. And so the message of the gospel is never clear. Conviction is not experienced. Because if somebody feels convicted, they may not come next week. So an entire program is established to make the, uh, the goats comfortable. And that's what happens. And what the Lord would have us to do is just speak the truth in love. Because when... The word of God goes forth and it's rightly divided. Then you're going to be able to see what is true and what is not true. That sense of uh, discomfort is really an important thing because it helps a person to become aware of where they really stand with God. And in that, people can actually receive conviction of the spirit and be saved. But if I didn't love people enough to tell them the truth, if I didn't love you enough to say, this is what the word says, then I'm not a true shepherd. I'm, I'm not a true, I'm not genuine. I'm actually just giving 
people in sin uh, a reason to remain there. And what Jesus said he'd do is he said he'd set us free from sin. And the way that occurs is through the teaching of the word. And when the word is divided rightly, it actually brings a sense of conviction to the believer because let's face it, every message is beyond what we actually live. So we're convicted and we say, God, help me to do that. I want to please you. So it brings conviction to the believer, but it also brings a conviction to the one who doesn't know the Lord. Because the one who doesn't know the Lord will look around and say, God truly is amongst these people. These people have a sincere faith in something that I haven't embraced yet. I need the God that they serve. That's how I got saved. I enjoyed the music. The music was contemporary for my day. But when they started talking about needing Jesus Christ, coming to faith in him, and explain that's the difference between what you're feeling right now and what these people have. What it is, is these people know Jesus. And to me, they were saying, you've only heard of him. That's called conviction. And so that's why I got saved when I said, they know him. I've only heard of him. I want to know him. And that's when I got saved. Through the truth of the message of the gospel. That's how you get saved. Anything less than that is dangerous. That's why Paul would say, I say this to your shame. There are people amongst you who don't have the knowledge of God because there's so much division and discord and so little teaching amongst you right now that you haven't been clear about what it means to follow Christ. So God help us to be clear what it means to follow Jesus Christ.